This is from Under This Blazing Light by Amos Oz. Most recently, I came to my attention that there's some quite controversial remarks made about Amos Oz by um, an Israeli musician, producer called Dudu El Arar, who wished him to be burned in, in uh, what was it? One of the concentration camps. I forgot which one it was now. Uh, Maidanik or something, Maidanik. He said, I wish for you to burn in the flames of Maidanik and to go into smoke after the comments you make. And I really wonder how he, Amosos had a reputation of being an extremist when for me he's not an extremist at all. So I wanted to read you something. Um, he's one of, for me, he's one of the few voices that give me hope. As long as Amos Oz lives here, there is um, there's hope for me and for everyone. I think people misunderstood him. Um, wanting peace is not necessarily the opposite of security for Israel. It's actually quite the opposite. So, it says here, Man is the sum total of all the sin and fire pent up in his bones. Introduction to a discussion on Berdichevsky. So, so this is a writer, an Israeli writer. I can talk about Berdichevsky the way one talks about a distant relation. Distant in the sense of an uncle whom I've never met because he died 18 years before I was born. I read his stories with curiosity, respect and awe. And as I read, a kind of genetic pulse within me bears witness to the distant relationship. Incidentally, distant relationship is Berdachevsky's own expression. He employed it to sign many of his essays. But the Chevsky writer was distant, apparently at least from the mainstream of Hebrew literature in his day. He did not follow the beaten track. He even lived a long way from the centers, the capital cities of Hebrew letters in his generations. He did not live in Odessa or Warsaw. He did not even come to Palestine. He drifted to Berlin and Breslau, Breslau, where Hebrew writing was an even more solitary business than elsewhere. He communicated with other writers, with editors and publishers, mainly by letter. His letters are often bitter and anguished. But Berdichevsky was not a solitary writer in the geographical sense alone. All over Europe, the great novelists were busy exposing the depth of the human psyche. All the various schools of Hebrew writers, too, were discovering the complexity of psychology of the individual's type societies. But Duchevsky did not think much of psychology. This was considered by many to be an unpardonable sin. How can there be such a thing as a writer who does not take the trouble to endow his characters with depth and complexity? What about their childhoods? Where are the complexes, the repressions, and so on? Is that how you portray character? Just a couple of sketchy lines and nothing more? How sloppy. Moreover, at a time when the heroes of Hebrew literature and their creators agonized page after page, chapter after chapter, volume after volume, over the great question of world reform, social justice, the solution to the Jewish problem, the question where to, in both general and specific terms, Berdichevsky seemed to relate to these matters as if they were only lines, and rather marginal lines at that, in the depiction of his characters. World reform is presented by various ideological movements appear in his books as the outward manifestation tamed and clothed of powerful naked urges. It is not that Berdichevsky was anti-ideological in the way that it is fashionable to be in our own times. It is not that he was not acquainted with the leaders of the movements in Europe and in Jewish people in his own day. He knew them, he supported, denounced, and so forth. But when he came to tell the story, his attitude was somewhat skeptical. As if to say, okay, chaps have all sorts of opinions, but they are merely restrained, conventional, and manifestations of primeval forces, whether as a domestic dog is a tame version of step wolf. And when the restraints are shattered, the dog will turn back into a wolf. It is only at, su at that point that a Berdachevsky story takes off. He was not interested in psychology or ideology, but in other things, such as the destructive power of repressed love 
or the influence of the elements on emotional urges, or the excommunication of Spinoza, or the savagery that lurks under the surfaces of a culture, religion, and society. In a certain sense, with great caution, one could say that Berdichevsky was the first metaphysical poet in modern Hebrew literature. So, let me skip. Berdichevsky did not think much of an epic detail of the realistic insistence on capturing small and great particulars, objects, lines, bodies. In fact, he rather despised it. He did not possess what my teacher Shimon Helkin called the urge to flash out reality. He was a spare writer, the opposite of Mendele, Bialik, Peretz, and their continuators. He did not attempt to capture the flow of things in words. He lacked that whole essential quality without which it is hard to tell a proper story. This was a flaw of a kind. His central of gravity was in another field. Often he shaped his heroes not as people of flesh and blood, but as representatives on earth of mysterious powers and natural forces, which seemed to become concrete, to take on human form, to be incarnated in mortal creatures walking onto the stage so as to act out an ancient play whose plot and gestures and action and very endings are as fixed as the planets in their orbits. So, but Achevsky's books are peopled by demigods, evil spirit, exterminating angels, terrifying demons and mysterious creatures, born not out of a novelist's observation, but out of the magical powers of a Kabbalist. Similar characters, creatures, were later to fill the pages of Isaac Bashevi Singer, whose relationship to Bredachevsky deserves study. All this is not to say that Bredachevsky's heroes are not human. They are wonderfully humane, wonderful human, because they almost always have to confront a difficult choice. Difficult choices are, of course, among the main concerns of life and literature. Bredachevsky's heroes are not put into the position where they have a choice between good and evil, between virtuous happiness and criminal disgrace. They generally face a choice between life and death, and let me add to dispel any simplistic assumption that in Bedachevsky this choice is particularly difficult because life resembles death, while death resembles a volcanic eruption. Those who choose life are condemned to live in pettiness, in rot, in mediocrity, in a constricting routine at the cost of total spiritual and sexual castration, the brutish existence of sheep that graze or milked or sheared and killed, whereas those who choose death are choosing a kind of magnificent union with the eternal principles, with the stars in their courses, with chaos for those who long for chaos, with God for those who fell to earth as demigods. This is why the choice confronting Berdichevsky's hero is both difficult and subtly deceptive, and at times the author hints to us somewhat inconsistently that in fact everything is predetermined and even the choice is merely a game, a ritual whose outcome was decided long ago. Hence also Berdichevsky's grand, grand eloquent language that is not afraid of monumental words, of raising its voice, of shouting, of archaisms and anachronisms that are occasionally rather crude. But Achevsky's language has no time for nuances, for subtle interplay of light and shade. But there is another kind of precision in his writing, which manifests itself not in particular in this sensitive choice of adjectives and adverbs, but rather in a certain gnarled ruggedness, such as you find in the bark of an old olive tree. Or again, the impatience in his writing. Many of his stories read like first drafts with the force of rough, half-chiseled stone. And Berdichevsky's has a passion, passionate adolescent openness for all the great intellectual currents of his day. He was fascinated by romanticism, but also liked anti-romanticism. He was fascinated, fascinated by Nietzsche by Scandinavian writers of the turn of the century, by symbolism, by expressionism, by the revival of pagan myths. He wrestled all these movements like an earnest Talmud student grappling with text. Take the young man called Michael in a story called Men Maha Na Ma sorry, Maha Naim. Maha Naim. Apparently one of the more 
patiently written stories. Mahanaim. This Michael is digging with all his might to reach something that is hidden under the surface of civilization. Civilization does not satisfy him. He's searching for the some kind of molten lava that he can plunge into. He wants to be swept up in primeval forces. Michael considers himself maddened by what he has seen. He calls himself an accursed, accursed Hebrew, a typically Verdachevskian expression. Not a passionate Greek, as Joseph Klausner called Chernichovsky. Not a cursed man, like the cursed Finn de Seikler. End of sequel, end of the shh, end of the century poets, but in a cursed Hebrew. But the Chevke was born and brought up in the shtetl, that's a Jewish town. He was born in my the sorry, Medjiboch, 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 Medjiboch in Podolia. He grew up in. To Bova in Ukraine and married in Taflik in Podolia. It was here that he became under the influence of the Hebrew Enlightenment, a Skala movement. His marriage broke up and he returned to Dobova before going on to study in the yeshiva of Volozin. He then moved to Varshad where he remarried but he was restless and published articles and stories until he divorced again and went to Odessa. And finally, at the age of about 25, oh my God, he married, he married and divorced so many times. By the time he was 25, he left Russia and went to study in Germany, where he lived for the rest of his life. In other words, he hailed from the heart of hearts of that East European Jewish shadow state, which led a shadowy half-existence without a government flag, army or stamps, but with eight or nine million inhabitants from the Baltic in the north to the Black Sea in the south, from the depth of Ukraine in the east to the gates of Berlin, Prague and Vienna in the west. Although it lacked the trappings of a state, it was splendidly civilized, with a religion, law, order, systems of education and welfare, a language, civilized manners, lullabies and fairy stories, music, justice, literature, economics, politics, power struggles and intellectual movements. Everything you can find in a more prosperous civilization also existed in the Eastern European Jewish shadow states. Uh, let me remark something. Jung said that the Jews don't have a culture, that they always are parasites on the culture in which they live. This disproves it so much. The Jews, in fact, had a very, very rich culture that spread over a few countries in that area in Europe. And anyone claims otherwise is an ignorant. Ignoramus. It was in no way inferior to normal nation states. In some respect, was far superior, indeed, to the present-day state of Israel. Despite the terrible poverty, nobody ever starved to death. There was not a man who could not at least read and write. There have been few normal states, either then or now, that could boast as much. But he doesn't sing the praises of the rock from which he was hung, and I do not want to sound an over-sentimental note. For all its intellectual resources, this Jewish shadow state was riddled with contradictions. It was founded on sexual repression, on suppressed emotions, on submissiveness, on benign fanaticism and dead letters. That is the other side of the coin. This was the state from which Berdichevsky hailed. There was, there he was married to his first wife without either party being consulted first. And there she was taken away from him by forcible divorce when he went on the bed and started reading forbidden books. He never returned to those places in his life. Yet, though he did not return, his stories never left. In all his stories, he wrote about the Jewish shadow state with hatred and longing and bitter mockery and compassionate, compassion and contempt. He wrote with gnashing of teeth, like someone maddened by what he had seen. This is not an unusual attitude in literature in general or in the Hebrew literature of this period that is known for some reason as the period of revival. So Dante stood on the threshold in the twilight of the Middle Ages. So stood Cervantes and Shakespeare in the twilight transition from one age to another. So stood Tolstoy, Gogol, Dostoevsky and Chekhov. The lovers, haters, gra grave diggers, and immortalizers of the ancient, mighty, dying Orthodox Russia. So stood Thomas Mann, the lover, mocker, elegy, 
elegists, and immortalizer of the bourgeois age. So too among our own writers, Mendeley, Bialik, Berdichevsky, Brenner, and all the crew stood on the threshold of the Talmudic Academy. The writer turns to the world that made him, observes it with terror, hatred, and intimacy, digs deep inside it until the digging itself becomes a form of killing. And as soon as the killing is over, he starts to mourn and memorize, memorialize and preserve in words and raise a monument, even perhaps to feel nostalgic. Even so, Berdachevsky, also known as Yerubal, Yerubal, a distant relation, an accursed Hebrew, set in Berlin and Breslau, doing a terrible thing. He described a world that was still alive and breathing 40 or 30 years before Hitler, as though it was dead and buried, and as though it was his task, writing as an archaeologist, to bring it back to life from scattered post pots, pots herds. A terrible yet fascinating standpoint, erecting a monument to the living, casting a death mask while his loved, hated ones were still alive, giving biblical names to the shtetls of Ukraine. For example, my mother's birthplace, that's uh, Amos Oz, not mine, Rovno is renamed Mishor. But the Chevsky stories are always steeped in longing for something that is always over there, far away, across the river. He was a keen collector of Hebrew folk stories, which he reworked, although not in the same way as Bialik and Ravinsky. On the contrary, Berdachevsky tried to produce a sort of anti-Sefer Haggadah, stressing an opposing mythology that was not Judaic, but ancient Hebrew, against the pedigree of rabbis, heads of academics, halachanics, the Jewish law, Hasidic masters, Berdichevsky attempted to establish a Canaanite dynasty of accursed ones that would shed a, de a different light. Perhaps one should ca say cast a shadow on the whole history of the Jewish people. They were the rejected heroes, victims of desires, ostracized and excommunicated. He tried to break up the religious topsoil so as to get it earlier, wilder, more passionate and carnal stratum underneath. This he did in a generation whose other writers were all devoting themselves to denouncing the distortion of Jewish society and believing, some more than others, in the possibility of reforming the Jewish psyche. But Duchevsky declared, there is no reform, only liberation from restraints. This liberation will bring about savagery, destruction and death. It is up to you to choose between death by suffocation and going up in flames. I hate the people who persuade, pers persecute, persecute the divine enlightenment, and I'm the enemy of our great luminaries who imposed upon us the whole system of dead laws and regulations. I am suffocating here, he says in Mahanaim. In Berdachevsky's stories, there are fateful encounters between men and the devil, men and the mysterious laws of the universe, the world of spirits and demons. There is a providence, he wrote in Mahanaim. Everything that happens down here is observed up there. Berdachevsky's passionate pursuits of mythological darkness does not always succeed. There are quite a few stories where while he rushed to expound the great game between God and Satan, a certain impatient manifests itself in relation to men. In between the hammer and the anvil, there is a sentence that reveals the limits of his powers of narration, and yet it is a wonderful, unforgetful sentence, almost a miniature epic poem in crystal. Man is the sum total of all the sin and fire pent up in his bones. 700, 777 different definitions have been produced by philosophers and poets down the ages. Man is a political animal, a rational being, a fallen god, a refinement of the ape, a restless being, a playing being. But before Bedachevsky, nobody defined man as the sum total of all the sin and fire pent up in his bones. And without her, the hero confronts a choice. That's a story called Without Her, yeah? The hero confronts a choice, whether to be a holy monk or a sinful lecher. There is no middle way. The two extremes resemble one another. 
because they are both associated with burning with ecstasy. There is no question of the third way. Emasculation, Buddhishness, Buddhist, Buddhishness, the dull routine of a sheep. But the Chevsky may have resembled, not just externally, the hero of his story alone, a short man who came here to complete his education, one of those people who suffer torments before they can manage a kiss, but polish their shoes twice a day. He was an autodidact, a refugee from the Jewish shadow state that still existed. He could not live in it, and he could not l live without it. But always and over again, and not and only over against it, a small man who polished his shoes twice a day and found it hard to kiss, yet who longed for madness because beyond it he spied a chance of height and depth, a shortcut to the heart of the great cosmic drama that involved the stars and winds, the desires, the cycle of nature. The great forces bursting through the limitation of civilization to become a beast or a god or both. He was a ghost hunter, and that is why he was a stranger to most of the writers and handful of Hebrew readers of his time, most of whom were devotees of national revival and renewal, and to most Hebrew readers of our own day too. So much for the introduction. Now discussion how it began. Now the discussion can begin. A blazing original and a faint copy concluding remarks. I must reply to one question. Question is, what is his message? What is the poet trying to say? Most people have an easier life because they only have secondary experiences. Yet in Berdachevsky's story, there is a constant fascination and the rushing into the heart of the primary experiences in life life, even though the price is often life itself. On the one hand, the masses stuck in a rut, kindly sheep or greedy hedonists who regard the world as a single great udder. One has to elbow one's way as to imbibe the maximum of success, possessions, favors, shallow thrills. On the other hand, possibility of a different relationship to the world, like the relationship of a moth to the flame, even at the cost of scorching one's wing of being burned so long as what happens is real life and not just a faint copy. <laughs>